right, everybody. That music means we are back. Not on our usual Tuesday time slot, but on a Wednesday, a rearing to go Wednesday. A lot of great content coming at you here today, listeners, because it's a fun day. It's a celebratory day here on the pro side because we are about to embark on pro Q&A session number 100. Yes, hard to believe. We are already at number 100. Seems like we just started these just a few months ago. And yet, here we are already at episode 100. So we thought, how could we celebrate this pivotal milestone? And you know what? We hit upon two very, very, very compelling celebratory items. First off, we have to welcome back the Oracle of New Hampshire himself, Mr. Matt Amberson from Orats. After all, he was our first guest on our very first pro Q&A session. So it made sense to make the circle complete and bring him back for episode 100. Then on top of that, because we love you folks, we thought we'd give you a sample. Give everybody a taste of the fun that's going on here on the pro. So right now, live, if you're over there on Twitter, you'll see the link out there. Just click on that and come right on in to the fun here today and today only pretty much but uh, today nonetheless you get a good taste of what we have cooking here in the pro so we do this pretty much every week listen as you bring on another great guest from the world of options and derivatives and allow our pro members to have free reign whatever questions are top of mind from them get to be answered here first and foremost on the we've gone deep on a lot of great crazy stuff we have obviously 99 already in the can so if you join up now on the pro you can go back and access all 99 of those you're talking 99 hours worth of content right there then of course on top of that every friday we also do options oddities it's usually myself and the rock lobster actually matt joins us occasionally there as well to talk all things unusual activity so we hunt for the most interesting most intriguing unusual trades of the week and then maybe sometimes we talk ourselves into doing some of them which is always fun Uh, so that's a lot of fun as well as you get early access to a lot of other shows we do here on the network for example our pro folks right now are getting a lot of the uh, oic content we recorded it's all heading out to them first before it goes out to the network as well as of course live access to everything we do as well as of course giveaways so if you guys want to join the party see what it's all about the options insider.com slash pro the place to go and like i said joining me today Back in the hot seat. It's been a while. We haven't chatted with him really since Pro Q&A 77 back on November 15th of last year. None other than the Oracle of New Hampshire himself, Mr. Matt Amberson from Morats. Matt, welcome back to the Pro Q&A hot seat. Episode 1, a few in between, and now episode 100, sir. How does it feel? (laughs) Yeah, it was an honor to be on one, and it's an honor to be on 100, and uh, it's great that the people, you've opened it up, and the people can come in and, and hear all the great content. I know I, I'm always searching for content, even, you know, I've been an expert and been in the options field since the 80s, and so, uh, but I still like to learn, and I'm sure all your clients are hungry for this uh this content so kudos to you mark for for uh seeing all these things and you know encouraging us to set up these reports whether they be the earnings report or now that i'm on option odyssey the uh unusual volume reports that's a lot of fun to be on on the oddities uh some uh, some really neat uh things that you wouldn't often see but you know looking at unusual volume i mean that's usually in the option market where things are happening so that's been fun to do. And like you said, uh, maybe we find a trade every now and then. So good to be here, Mark, for 100. Yes, we're luring you to the dark side slowly but surely. First, the earnings data. Now we're learning you to the dark side of unusual activity. Who knows what will be next, man? <laughs> Where we will lead you. What dark rabbit hole we will lead you down next, sir. But yeah, it's hard to believe you haven't been on the Pro Q&A since last November. So we haven't even talked to you in the Pro Q&A this year, which is crazy. So let's start there. Uh, We started the year with a lot of our guests kind of getting their sentiment and their outlook for the year. Obviously, now we're coming into, uh, it's hard to believe, we're almost closing in on June, almost closing in on halfway through the year. So I know at the start of the year on some of our other shows, Matt, you had a bit of a dire outlook, dire prognostication, including for this earnings season. Things have been, let's say, interesting. Obviously, start of the year, we had more rally than people expected. These days, we seem like we're glued around this 4,100 level out there. So right now, looking back on the first five months and change of the year, how is this unfolding versus your expectations? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've been uh, I've been a bearish 
Um, but, you know, always keeping in mind that the, the uh, markets can remain irrational longer than most people could remain solvent or something like that. And so, uh, you know, what I've been saying is like, th listen, you're uh, if you're buying this market, you're getting in at, at uh, P.E. multiples that, that are pretty silly, I think. They're pretty high. And, but the hard thing is, how do you position yourself and what do you do? Well, uh, you know, and like, you know, I've been saying it probably since November is uh, you, you have to have these way out of the money puts, I think, um, but not have too many negative deltas. So you got to be selling some some tight put spreads so you don't lose too much, but you keep some deltas. Watch the signals. Um, we've been we've been fortunate. You know, we have our. Uh, internal ORATS meetings, training club meetings, and watching, uh, you know, we're, it's the, the uh, signals this week are bullish. So, and the market's kind of looking like it right now. What we look at, and it's no secret, we look at, you know, the falling implied volatility is bullish. Uh, rising contango uh, is bullish. That means the front month is going down relative to the back month. And we have these forward volatility relationships. When they get pretty stable, that's that's pretty bullish as well. And they've been stable. So, uh, and and we were a little bit bearish for this the, this that down draft a um, few weeks ago. So, what you know what we're doing is is or at least what I'm doing for my uh, my own portfolio is there are a lot of good places to get uh, returns out there. Um, you know, it's driving the banks. The, especially the regional banks crazy because they can't really offer these 5% rates that you could get. So, you know, you park your money in, in bonds or you park your money in some, some uh, money markets and you could get a pretty good return. Uh, I'm underweight equities overweight. You know, I have puts in my, uh, uh, I think puts is an asset class. You know, it's, it's really the only thing that's truly negatively correlated when it comes down to it. You know, when the market's just getting whacked, even gold, uh, you know, people are selling out of gold to cover margin. And so uh, crypto as well. So really puts uh, are, are, are really the, the only negatively correlated asset in my book. Um, and you could even uh, argue that VIX is, is not, uh, even though, you know, typically it does go up. But, you know, like I've been calling, I think this is going to be a, a well- uh, contrived <laughs> slide uh, if we get it. Um, you know, I think that the, a lot of people are already positioned for, for their bearishness, and that's what's kind of booing the market. You know, Wall Street climbs a wall of worry, and it, I think it's true here. Uh, but at some point, it's going to get a little bit too ugly. Uh, the Fed's going to break something, uh, raising interest rates. They're not even near their 2% target. So the Fed's fighting against the market. Um, and you got to listen to them. I mean, they're saying that we want to control inflation and inflation's kicking up um, and, you know, it's still there. So uh, as a matter of fact, the market usually in the recessions don't usually come till the Fed says, uh, uh, uh oh, we're, we need to start lowering uh, rates. Uh, but we don't I don't really see that for a bit. So, uh, you know, my look, my outlook is 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 definitely bearish but you have to be very careful and you have to be you know not too short but you have to have your puts in position you have to you know and, and when i say position too I, I we're not just long puts you know we're long way out of the money puts and we're long put put calendars so what that what those are are you know, you're selling some puts um, against buying some puts so as the market goes down if you look at, at a, the payoff of a calendar it's like a tent uh, and the the tent, uh, the apex of the tent is at your your uh, strikes, and so if you, if they're out of the money, you want that mu that market to drift down, which I think it's going to do. I don't think this is going to be a um, a going down by the elevator up with the escalator. I think it's it's going to be going down with the with the escalator. It's going to go down slowly. People are going to realize uh, that the market's overvalued. Uh, they're already positioned well. So, so that's my outlook, Mark, and you know I'm still sticking with it. I think the, you know, the PE ratio should be, in, especially in a recession, which I'm I'm counting on, is supposed to be something around 15 or 16, and I think we're up at 18, 18, 19 almost in the PE, that which is way high. So, you know, you just you, you can't get 
too bullish here. Um, you know, short term, yeah, we 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 put on some some trades that that um, will will uh, we'll, that we'll talk about later that that are that are pretty cool around the uh, you know some intermittent bullishness, but like long term and overall, you know, pretty bearish, Mark. So that's how I stand. All right. A lot to unpack there. I see the people starting to filter in there. If you are new, remember, you can put your questions there in the live chat. We got Nichols. Congrats on 100th episode. Thank you, Nichols. Yes. Uh, I'm not, I don't think you've been around for all of them. Maybe, maybe pretty close, though. You've been around for quite a while. So uh, thank you for listening to most of those 100 Pro episodes, as well as, of course, all of the options oddities. I don't think we're quite at 100 with options oddities, but pretty darn close. So, yeah, you're talking nearly 200 episodes of official content, plus all the pro early release stuff you put up there on that pro feed. So that pro feed, pretty jam-packed with content. So if you, if you need extra options content in your life, and a lot of it is indeed evergreen, which is always fun, then check it out over there on the pro side. Uh, Matt, you kind of touched on this with your, your kind of first answer there. But this first question comes in from Hedwig, and he wants to know, how is your guest positioning in his portfolio for the second half of the year, you kind of mentioned it. You got some cash and money markets. You got some puts. Uh, but before you go any farther, l- let me just provide some context for your answer. Because we asked, asked this exact question to our audience last week. as was our question of the week. We said, quite simply, in these troubled times, where are you allocating the majority of your portfolio? Gave you four choices, cash, crypto, equities, or commodities slash fixed income. Yeah, I know. We had write-ins for Vol. We had people asking, why are commodities and fixed income the same? Don't blame us. Blame Twitter. Only four slots. But at the end of the day, this is how you folks voted. 45.6% said cash. So you're kind of feeling what Matt was putting down. And quite frankly, a lot of our guests in the pro Q&A hot seat, I think the majority of the ones we polled recently have been in cash or some equivalent. (laughs) Not a ton out there really riding high on the bullish side, but intriguing nonetheless. Uh, 32.4% for equities, 19.1% for commodities slash fixed income. And bringing up the rare 2.9% for crypto. So, Mr. Matt, maybe let's start there. Are you surprised that so much of our admittedly pretty savvy audience, even they, are sitting in cash right now? And then, B, again, you said you kind of touched on this, but do you have anything else you want to add for Hedwig and the rest who want to know how you're positioning right now? Have at it, sir. Yeah, that, that, that does look like a big cash number. You know, anytime you're getting near 50 50 in cash, you know, the people that, that that's quite a bit, um, you know, crypto, uh, you know, so I run the permanent portfolio on, on a bunch of my uh, on my assets. So I don't have to look at it. And it's there's a fund and it's done well over, you know, the past I don't know, 10 years or so. So that's 25 cash, 25 percent cash, 25 percent equities, 25 percent gold, 25 percent fixed income. Um, and then I throw when I do a, a permanent portfolio, I throw about uh, five to ten percent crypto in there. So uh, I'm surprised crypto is so low. I was just going to say, where's uh, your Solana allocation, sir? <laughs> yeah, no Solana, <laughs> just Bitcoin actually. So um, you know, so th- again, that's my kind of overall thing. And then and then in my trading accounts, you know, like I said, I have uh, you know I have a lot in puts. So my you know not a lot of money, but the notional amount. Uh, is covering a lot of, of my uh, of my especially equities, but you know I think like I said everything is going to go down. If if we go down hard, everything goes down. So you know again I I think there should be a put allocation, um, and you have to be careful. Um, you know again uh, the strategy is not just a long thirty day thirty delta put you'll get killed. That's five you know it's going to cost you four or five percent you know in our back testing, but. If you're doing way out of the money puts, maybe that's one or two percent um, a year that you're that you're draining out. But if you're doing these uh, calendars, you could get it under one percent. So my insurance isn't that high. And again, I'm watching signals, and we're trading around. Uh, you know, we have a lot of great uh, signals. We have a signal uh, uh, tied in with our our back testing signal tied in with our uh, alerts now. So. We're able to we're able to uh, uh, see what's going on and trade around it pr- pretty efficiently. Um, and so, like for example, that's where like you know today like we're, we're saying okay, well it's it's bullish. Um, so you know we're 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 looking at at some um, at some stra- at some strategies, not not terribly bullish, but you know some some calendars 
uh, some diagonal uh, call diagonals. Um, I've actually liked lately, it was almost by accident, but uh, I'm doing a, uh, my long is more in the money than my short. And you might say, well, you know, that's a lot of premium, that's a lot of Vega, um, but it's actually kind of working out. So I, I have a $5 differential. Um, and I just, I have some, uh, calls that are, uh, out of, you know, that they're slightly out of the money and then, uh, that I'm long maybe two or three days, four days, five days. And then I'm short the one, two or three day slightly more out of the money, but you can still get some decent premium. If you just, you know, not zero DT, but one day, two days, there's a, there's a fair amount of premium and that comes in really quick on a zero DTE. So uh, that, that diagonal has actually been, uh, been working pretty well. So, uh, in, you know, so to, to answer Hedwig, you know, my, my positioning is, is, you know, pretty typical, uh, uh, permanent portfolio for most having some puts, uh, having a little bit of crypto and then playing the, the signals like we're bullish. So we're going to, we're going to play a little long and we're, we're going to have some short put spreads in there, tight ones to, kind of counteract the 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 bleed that we that we have on, on the put calendars some of the put spreads and straight puts that we have way out of the money stuff long really long term so that's that's how i'm sitting uh, mark interesting that diagonal is interesting it doesn't make it prohibitively expensive to do the diagonal by by structuring that way in the spx you could do it for like 500 bucks okay uh, between five and six hundred bucks for a, and, it, and it's it's really yeah, I know. It, it, it actually uh, makes you think because I'm saying, okay, well, it's five dollars wide. You know, a put spread that, that or a call spread that's five dollars wide could only get to five dollars. However, the diagonal, you know, and getting time on it, you know, we I sold one the other day for ten fifty, and then we have this new uh, trade history. We just released it. I don't know if you got the email, but we have this trade history analyzer. So I went back over that trade every minute and it got up to 12 bucks. I mean, if, if, can you imagine like, you know, it's, it's $5 wide, granted it's a diagonal. Um, and that got up to 10, you know, $10, $12 wide. So, and you know, generally if you buy them out a couple of days, uh, they're, uh, you know, like I said, five bucks, something like that in the SPX. So yeah, it, 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 it is, you take a look at it. It's a strange trade. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen it once someone did, someone had it. I, I, re, I just remember on, on a watching a YouTube where, where they did that. I go, that's kind of a weird trade. And then I kind of did it and then I said, okay, I gotta, I gotta watch this thing, but it, you know, they're doing okay right now. Um, yeah. So, uh, so take a look at the, at the diagonal where you're long and slightly more in the money, which you would think it would be counter counterintuitive, but it, it's actually working all right, Mark. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't immediately leap off the pages. That's what I want to do, but uh, it's intriguing. I'll have to check that one out. Intriguing. That's why you tune into the Pro Q&As, listeners, for intriguing nuggets like that. Let's keep rolling here. Let's go out to uh, Seymour. Let's go to Seymour. He wants to know, uh, is Matt surprised that the current earnings season isn't as disastrous as he and many others anticipated? Yeah, we were talking at the start of the year, Matt, on some of our other shows we had Q1, maybe it was a bit of a question mark, but it seemed like you and a lot of people were really just pretty much fixated that season two, the cycle we're in right now, was really going to be kind of a bit of a just a disaster. It hasn't been terrible. It's been kind of mixed. You know, I think people are playing the game pretty well. They're doing that whole, you know, uh, beat down expectations so they could clear that much lower bar. But as Seymour wants to know, are you surprised at the current, current earnings season? isn't as disastrous as you anticipated. Um, I am. And uh, first of all, these questions are great questions. So your, your, your pro listeners are, are um, quite insightful and they have good memory, which is great. Um, yeah. So I thought, uh, and actually what's happening too, uh, you know, we've come down, d depending on how you look at, at earnings, uh, you know, it, it was up around almost uh, 250 for, for the S and P now, I, I thought it would come down a, a, about 20%. So that's like between 200, 210. Um, it has come down, but you're right. I think people, I, I think a lot of the companies are managing expectations pretty well. 
And I also think a lot of the mega comp companies have kind of uh, done better than people have thought. For example, especially the banks, you know, they got a windfall with all these regionals going out of business. Uh, so the banks did, the big banks did all right. Uh, you know, and the apples and metas and all that, you know, they're getting their uh, big government contracts and such. So they're, they're, they're and Microsoft, they're doing all right. Uh, but, you know, now we're coming into retail. Uh, Target did okay, but actually, if you look at, you know, a, a lot of the numbers were, were, were poor. Um, and then Home Depot, Home Depot really got smacked. Um, they were they were poor. So I think the 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 consumer is weakening. Um, you know, I think we are going to see a recession. Uh, it's been put off pretty well. Um, and you know, I mean, you know, kind of kudos to. Uh, the, the economy itself, it's just kind of bumping along and everyone's kind of looking at each other. It's like, you know, everyone knows it feels weak. There's, got, I mean, real estate is just ugly, um, especially commercial real estate. Uh, and then, you know, people are waiting for the shoe to drop. You know, I think most people uh, that have seen these before, you know, that it takes a little bit longer than than your expectations. So I'm, I'm still fully uh, expecting, you know, there to be earnings problems, with, which we actually are seeing. Um, it's just not as evident in the uh, volatility and, and, and high profile names are not getting whacked like we, we thought might. Uh, but yeah, I am surprised that, that it isn't uh, worse than expected. But, but, you know, I think you bring up a good point. Everyone's kind of expecting bad and so if you get slightly good, like Target today, you know, it kind of goes up a little bit. So, uh, you know, it's all about, you know, inflation's all about expectations. And I guess earnings all about expectations, too. But, you know, you, you, for, you can only keep these uh, hot potatoes in the air for so long before uh, they start burning people. And I think that's going to be pretty soon, Mark. All right, let's go out to the live. Let's go to PL Man. He says, Matt. I want to write some three-month options. Should I wait a few more days to take advantage of increased volatility around the debt ceiling drama? Yeah, that's that seems to be why we're rallying today. Of course, at the end of the day, more buyers than sellers out there. But it does appear to be some hope, some rays of sunshine in the debt ceiling debate. It is always terrifying, Matt, when our, our nation is in the grips of pretty much in the control of a bunch of staffers trying to uh, debate this stuff amongst each other. The head people don't meet until the staffers are done. That's always good for the, the future of our nation. But yes, they're saying there is some progress on the debt ceiling. P&L man wants to know, he wants to write some three-month options. He doesn't say on what. So if you have a particular underlying you like, make sure you let us know, P&L man. But he wants to know if he should wait a little bit more to take advantage of, of a bit of what he assumes will be a debt ceiling vol pop, sir. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I don't like to to write naked options. I would I would suggest him just looking at a little bit of protection, um, and you could even uh, again get a shorter term, just something to protect yourself. So I, I you know I don't like I don't like the uh, naked writing naked. Yeah, I'm but. pretty sure he usually does covered calls. That's what he's asked about in the past. I'm assuming these are like covered call type trades. Right. Yeah. So uh, you know, again, I I think you're you're playing with fire. I mean, you know, I think in the short term it. You know the market looks bullish. Again, I think that you know the, there's a, there's a a circus going on in in Washington now. I, I, you know, it pains me to watch the so, you know debt ceiling and you know they kind of build that up. So I, I you know I watch the markets a little bit more. I mean the markets are the volatility is 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 very low, uh, and the actual volatility is is low as well. So uh, you know. When you write, it seems it seems a little cheap right now. The ball to me. When you want to write, there's you know, there's blood in the streets and the market has just fallen. So, um, you know, I I think I'd wait for a little bit uh, a little bit more pain if we get if we get a knee jerk down. If something happens. I mean, there's a lot that can happen out in the markets and the and the macro environment. Um, you know, Powell's going to speak on Friday. There's going to be an option option X is also Friday. So. Uh, I'd be inclined to wait a little bit if you're if you're riding the, the vol's pretty low, um, markets are kind of high. I'd wait for I'd, I'd wait for a little bit of a correction before I do that, Mark. There you go, P and L man. Interesting question. Remember, if you folks have questions in the live, get them in there in that chat, just like P and L man and the rest did there. Let's go out to let's go to Meats, Mister Meats with a Z, another longtime listener. I believe he's been here for 
pretty much all 100. So we love all of our old schoolers here. Mr. Meats wants to know, uh, where does Matt fall with zero DTE trading? Also, where does this end? Obviously, there is interest in them, so the brokers and exchanges will follow the volume. But how short is too short? Well, we'll be talking about five-minute contracts at this time next year. What is the practical limit to these things? We kind of touched on zero day earlier. You and I have talked about it on other shows as well. So I, I know you're a fan, but maybe for Meats and everyone else who hasn't maybe heard some of those appearances, maybe lay down now, where do you fall on the whole zero day trend, I guess you can call it? And then B, Meats also wants to know, where do you think the, the practical limit of this stuff is? Are we going to be talking about you know sub one hour options in a year or two? Yes. Yeah. Another good question. So zero TT, where to fall? Yeah. I, I think they're, uh, I think it's great. It's been great for, you, you know, at, at my heart, you know, I'm a finance major, uh, masters in finance and, and, you know, I want to, uh, I want to see what the market thinks about timeframes and relationships. And it actually helps people in finance price companies, price debt, price, uh, the risk in the market. So, the, I mean, the option markets, you know, people say, ah, oh, it's just betting. You know, they don't really know. I mean, it, this is a this is a very good thing that we have, and it's making uh, finance a lot more uh, rational, structured, important uh, to the overall economy, uh, business decision makers, et cetera. So um, I think it's going to go down to hourly, could be half hourly. You know, I mean, if you think about Powell, uh, you know, they do the FM, FOMC at 2 Eastern and then they do the the, the press conference at 2.30. You could see how much uh, the market thinks the, the market is going to move during that time. And I think that's important information for people. Um, you know, and, and people are saying, oh, it's just gambling. That's short, so short term. But, you know, the, a lot happens in short term data. I mean, companies are going down to short-term, you know, credit card information and making decisions based on that. So there's a lot of information that's super important that can come out of intraday expiration. So, yeah, maybe not five minutes, but, you know, I would think half hour, hour, um, you know, probably hours. I've been talking hours for, for a while. And then while I'm at it, you know, I, the zero DTE, I, I think, is a boon for market makers, too. You know, what, what happens is as a market maker, what you hate is you have these kind of structurally uh, formulated positions on that you're taking the other side. So most people are, are maybe buying puts or at least big banks are buying puts for regulatory and other reasons. And you're getting a lot of calls. So you're, you're long the upside uh, and you're short the downside. Well, zero TTEs allow you to quite quickly hedge that downside, for example. Um, and there's so much uh, liquidity that you don't have to take it down so much because there, you know, there are a number of market makers and, and a number of big players in there that'll take down some some very good size. As, as if you could see, and just an incredible amount of notional is, is trading uh, in the zero DTEs, and that's actually super helpful for for most market makers. That you know they're very nimble. And they could expect, you know, a lot of volume and they could expect the ability to to be able to hedge out their kind of structural books. Um, and so I think it's been, you know, very helpful. And it's actually been I think uh, it, it, it has, uh, you know, suffocated uh, the volatility in a sense, you know, at least taken a, away a little bit. But uh, so, you know, I'm a fan of the zero DTEs and I think we'll see probably hourly tomorrow. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. Just not too long ago, you had most of the big exchanges were pushing back against all things even remotely related to binaries, right? They were seen as the, you know, the den of iniquity in the world of derivatives. They were, <laughs> they were the shady part. And now CME has event contracts, uh, all SIBO and everyone else have these these zero-day contracts, which aren't quite binaries, but they're kind of a half step towards them. And now we're talking maybe hourlies down the road. That certainly does have a lot of binary characteristics to it. So, yeah. We're heading down that road, I guess, Matt. It's inescapable at this point. They're going to go with the volume as they are for-profit public companies at the end of the day, as Meats points out. So uh, intriguing stuff here. Let's keep on rolling. Let's go out here to who's next. Let's go to Pete, Pete 05. Uh, <laughs> here we go. This is along the lines of what we are just talking about here, Matt. 
He wants to know what strategy back tests the best for zero day trading. Is it just as simple as selling credit verticals all day? You know, you talk to exchanges like SIBO and others who handle a lot of this flow in their SPX product. They've been telling me that this is some of the most symmetrical flow they've ever seen, where they're seeing, you know, a lot of spreads going up. There's not very little bias in, in one direction or the other. So it seems like the audience is liking a lot of that kind of uh, vertical action. But Mr. Matt, you're out there crunching the numbers, which is funny, funny to say in and of itself, running a back test on a one day trade, but that's where we are now, Matt. Uh, so yeah, Pete, and I'm sure a lot of our other listeners want to know what back tests the best when you've been looking at it. So, you know, back tests, anyone, there's not a lot of alpha in just, you know, saying, hey, do this or do that. Where there's alpha is when you start looking at, well, why should I do that? And what is the timing for it? What is the uh, current environment that we're in? I mean, that's what we're concentrating a lot of our back testing on is, um, you know, is is vol rising, is vol falling? Um, do our, you know, are the... Uh, Volatility measurements more bullish, i.e., uh, IV falling, contango going, uh, contango going up, so, which means the front month's going down comparatively. Uh, by the way, we also have a zero DTE uh, measurement uh, like the SIBO. Uh, so that's it was, it was interesting that they came out with that. So we look at that as well. That relationship um, is important in, in back testing. So. It's not as easy as, as uh, you know, what strategy is good for, for zero day, day trading in general. Um, it, it, I, what we're going to get to is what strategy is good for certain environments. And the definition of the environments, the important things that we're seeing in the environments are, you know, for, for the underlying, you know, just simply moving averages, where is the stock versus the moving average uh, as far as signals for the or, or environment uh, definitions for volatility, of course. You know the zero DTE versus the the ten day uh, constant maturity are are things that we look at. You know how is that relationship? The higher it is, you know the better it is for selling. Me- meaning if the zero DTE is high compared to the ten day, that, that's better for for uh, you know more aggressive selling. Um, and you know the the opposite is true as well. We also look at we have a one day um, we have a one day historical volatility that's um, we look at that direction. So what what that means is, uh, you know, yesterday's uh, volatility is important. One day volatility is important. Uh, the reason we could do that is we have this modified uh, Parkinson calculation that uses intraday volatility because most volatility you're going to need to at least use three days, you know, to get a, a two day close to close. Uh, but if you use a modified Parkinson, which we've tested out, against um, our old method that we used to use we used to actually simulate scalping gamma and turn that into a volatility but we found that the the way that we modified the parkinson uh, was close enough to that to make it uh, you know not use not beneficial or cost effective for us to have to go through that very expensive calculation because we had to download all the the tick data for every day and simulate trading against it so I, i know this might be a little bit technical but um what you look at is is, is how much the, the market's moving that's a historical volatility you look at what the implied is versus you know other constant maturities uh so the zero dte versus the 10 day um iv and you look at direction of those um i watch all day that direction you know and and we're we're constantly coming up with signals get in get in get out get out, get out, get out you know so that type of thing so um, so it's not just one strategy. Um, however, um, one of the things that, that I found is um, kind of early-ish in the morning, so I would say you know, 10 o'clock or so, there are often some opportunities to sell like way out of the money uh, verticals that might be 20, 25 wide. Um, and you're 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 risking about you know it's about a ten to one risk. So, but the win the win rate in that I think is greater than the, the than the loss rate. And if you're um, you know if it's markets going against you, you you get out. But you're but those are those are I think a lot of where there there is some still some uh, edge in the market is and kind of earlier when there's uh, you know the market would have to make a big move in order for, for that 
a particular strategy to uh, to lose money. And then if you get later in the day, um, and especially currently when, when the markets have the not a lot of premium in it, you, you just can't sell. Um, there, there's not you're not getting enough premium in, in order to sell it. So if you were just going to look at a strategy, I would look at you know kind of a time and get as far out of the money as possible. Um, do it as tight as you can, and and those are uh, and then you know just have your stop loss uh, or have some signals and and then get out you know with a certain amount of profit. And that's that's been pretty successful for our our testing and trading actually. So uh, so that's what I'd say to that, Mark. Interesting. Early morning, out of the money vertical. Got to get the early bird gets the worm these days, quite literally out there in zero day, which means I will miss all those trades, Matt. I am not an early bird anymore. <laughs> I'm a late night bird. I'm the other way around. I'm a night owl. All those years of going to the SIBO uh, crazy early burned the early bird out of me. I'm done. <laughs> all right, let's go to since you're just talking about the one day uh, measures of vol. Let's jump to this question here from JLS because it dovetails nicely. JLS wants to know quite simply. What does Matt think of One Day VIX? Matt, this has been all the rage. SIBO launched this a couple of weeks ago. Some folks love it. Some folks hate it. Our audience was surprisingly indifferent to it. They thought it was kind of not really a meaningful indicator for them. I think around three quarters of our audience came in on they weren't, weren't really planning on paying attention to that. So that kind of surprised me. Well, first off, give us your thoughts on One Day VIX, maybe what you like about it, what you don't. And then you said you have your own measure. Maybe how does that compare or contrast to what the SIBO is doing? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we use the, uh, you know, what most people use is uh, implied volatilities u- using binomial. Um, and then we have ways to, uh, you know, solve for, for futures contracts. And we use a bunch of out-of-the-money calls, out-of-the-money puts. And we, dr- we draw, uh, you know, some, uh, kind of a smooth modified cubic spine through that. So we get a very good. Uh, volatility and what most people are expecting. If you're looking at your your trading application, uh, you know you, you have a certain volatility that you're looking at. You know we do that all through the day. Uh, you have to be able to tick down the day, um, meaning um, you know we start at 95% of, of a day at the at the open and go down to 5% of the day at the close and kind of a straight line through there. So it's a little technical, but that's you know we have a minute by minute basically vix um i think that's how the the SIBO does it uh, i mean I, I think that they're updating it all, all through the day so it's not just a one day vix it's just you know it's constantly looking at the the one day volatility so you have to you know b- but you know the way the the vix calculation um does its thing it, it's it's kind of strange to me uh so i you know i haven't looked at it uh, that closely i know that ours uh, I think it, it is important. I would uh, I, I would venture to guess that the VIX, you know, works uh, decently well. Um, you know, again, I, the way I would use it is is the relationship between the one day VIX and like a ten day. Uh, you know, I don't like five day because you kind of get these calendar. If you get too many uh, too many weekends in there, but so we we compare it to our ten day to to get a get a feeling for what is that ratio, and then. Then we were we're testing that ratio against um, certain strategies. So I, you know, I think in general it's good. Um, again, I, you know, the VIX calculations is not uh, that coherent to me. That's you know, it's a little strange to me. Uh, you know, most people are using uh, binomial methods to to figure out implied volatilities. Um, so that's that's the one that I look at. You know, my mine is matches what's in the market, and so I could go trade it. Whereas a VIX, if you go look at at at, at the SPX, and after looking at the VIX, you're like, what 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 does this relate to? So, um, you know, so that that's that's how I, I'd answer that question. Mark, it seems like a lot of people take issue too with the fact that once you get around noon in the session, the SIBO is looking primarily at the next day's options more so than that same day zero day, which I guess is kind of a bit of a necessary evil when you're looking at options that go away so quickly. But I think that rubs some people the wrong way. They don't want to see all those next day options in there as well. They want to kind of just focus on what is implied, right? So that seems to be a bit of a sticking point as well. Do you guys do something similar with your measure? Oh, yeah, we go all the way to the last minute. So I mean, there's still, you know, there's still premium. 
And so you could still, you know, and we tighten it up and, and we know that it's, there's a certain amount of percent of the day left. Um, as long as you're consistent, I mean, you should, that's what you should definitely should be doing. So yeah, you know, skipping to the next day. Again, that's, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to, to, to look at the SPX imply, you know, cause you're trading zero days, right? So you, but you're not going to be able to compare it. So I, you know, I, you know, I, th I think it's a good thing to, you know, in general, but it, it, you know, devil's in the details on this calculation. Yes, as with all things VIX, the devil is very much in the details. Let's go back to some of these other questions. Uh, we leapfrogged here to get to JLS. Let's go back to Stego. We had Option God saying uh, congrats. Well, thank you, Option God. It has been a fun run. A 100 Option Queen, congrats. Thank you, too. Remember, if you guys got questions in, uh, get them in the live now. We got a lot of people got in ahead of you here via the early questions. But if you have some live questions, man, we make sure we bubble those to the surface here as well. Let's go out to, let's go to Stego. Stego says, is it even worth, is it even worth uh, it trading? I think he means, it just means, is it even worth trading butterflies in short duration contracts or do the commissions make it not worth the premiums collected? So it sounds like he's looking at some zero day flies. I have seen more than a few people write in about zero day flies on the surface. It sounds like nonsense, but a lot of people are writing in about it, so it's intriguing nonetheless. Uh, sounds like he wants to do short flies, too, so he wants to collect some premium. And he wants to know, is it even worth doing it, or is do the commissions wipe out any potential premium you could get, Matt? Have you been doing, you mentioned out-of-the-money verticals. Have you done any back tests on flies in zero day, sir? Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, the we all have our favorite strategies, you know, and I, and I should be agnostic, but I, I just... I can't get flies to work for me. <laughs> I just, you know, at some point I'm going to have to just find a good fly strategy. And it seems like zero DTEs would be good because, you know, you're trying to, if you're long it, you're you're trying to pick a strike where it's going to go to. Uh, and some of my my friends are using, you know, these charm and gamma weighted things, you know, to see what where, where the 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 market is likely to end up, uh, and they're using that with. Uh, you know, with flies, and I and I know there are some uh, some people out there that, that you know uh, across the internet that are using flies, um, you know, short term zero DTE flies. Again, I I haven't had success with them. Uh, I've tried them. Uh, we've back tested them. They they don't particularly back test that great. Um, I know there's a lot of other. You know, if, if you if you watch um, and read about some of these people that are successful at it, they have you know a lot of these rules and such that that are are a bit complex. Um, you know, the short fly is tough. You know, the great thing about the SPX and, and the indexes, though, is you, know, you don't have to worry about um, getting exercise. So you could put a fly on and just let, let it sit there till, till the very end. So it's kind of nice. Um, one of the things I, 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 could, I, I could say, though, is when I'm using a fly, uh, as it goes by the fly, um, that's when I take it off. Like, so if it gets near it, I don't, I don't get greedy. <laughs> I, I I take you know I, I usually do an out of money fly, um, and if, if for cheap, and then if it goes by it, you know take your little bit of money and and get out of there. So uh, that's tested you know okay, um, and that's the way I play it on, on certain days when I um, you know when I want to when I find out that the you know when I, and and when I see that the the flies are are pretty cheap, I'll, I'll put them on again, um, you know like. Recently, with a ball this low, you could get a fly on, and then you know the market's moving a decent amount as it goes by. Is you know you should you should be ready to 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 take it off. I don't use a price exit or a profit exit. I use a near the money exit. So if it's if it's right at the money, that's when I take it off. So that's just my advice on, on those things, Mark. There we go. Let's go out to uh, Twitter. This is what we were talking about a few minutes ago, Matt, about the the best time of day to trade zero days and you said early in the morning as well as right towards the the end of the day and we have looks this john tate he's agreeing with you but he says the the last two minutes are pretty good for him so he's going he's going right up to the wire <laughs> have you gone all the way to the last two minutes matt in your zero day trading i think i've done everything <laughs> um i actually especially when uh you, you could get these puts for for super cheap and um, you know, even a put spread for 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 very very little in S, in terms of SPX uh, notional, 
And, you know, they'll hit it sometimes. So I've had some of my best trades are, are very close, you know, and I'm watching the seconds. So, yeah, like that's, a, you know, with, with just a little bit of time left, you know, you buy an out of the money put spread for, for very little, you know, 10 cents, 20 cents. And, you know, all of a sudden you'll see a pop in the market. You know, that, that's when, you know, buyers, uh, you know, imbalances, who knows what happens near, near the close. But I, I think that I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that, um, you know, there's some opportunity in that in that time, uh, time space. The old gamma bombs, they're exploding right at that moment. So yeah, if, you, if you can dodge absolutely. the explosions, <laughs> you maybe can get some, get some good trades off. Uh, let's go out. Actually, already come up against it, man. Time flies when you're having fun, Matt. Let's go out to Wolfpack. Wolfpack says, Matt has said in the past that you should sell covered calls as far out of the money as possible since they limit the returns of the underlying stock. Should I take it from this that you just shouldn't sell covered calls in a stock because they limit your overall returns. Now, Matt, I think he's referring to in the past, you have said in your, in your back tests when you're looking at covered calls, uh, the ones that perform the best are the ones that have the, you know, the farthest out of the money strikes because the underlying stock is the big driver of returns at the end of the day. So as Wolfpack's reading that to say he just shouldn't bother with covered calls, is that correct, sir? Well, I mean, that's what our testing has found out, that um, you know, it's, it's, it's rarely that helpful to sell these calls because you're giving up a lot. So what we also found was you, you have to get a high spread yield, which, which is the, the option premium divided by the stock. So you, you have to get, you know, a lot of money. You have to get uh, and, and do it out of the money, um, you know, because, again, the way stocks move, you know, now if it's an index, it's different. But the way stocks move is, is some like, you know, you, you, you see these weird statements about Apple, like if you take out the last – five big moves in Apple over the past five years, uh, the returns are negative or something, you know, something weird like that. So you, you can't give away a big move. Um, so, uh, you know, I counsel then, you know, on either call spreads. Uh, so even if it is a big move, you're, you're, you're covered or uh, way out of the money. So you're happy if it, if it goes uh, up that far. So that, that's kind of my feeling on it, Mark. Interesting. I make a lot of our covered call traders very sad there, Mr. Mr. Matt. Breaking hearts out here on the pro Q&A. So we got time for a few more here. Let's go to, I just like this handle. Whenever you send in a question, we'll always ask it. Mean Gene, because I like your handle. Mean Gene Ashford. He's obviously down with our 80s wrestling trivia game every Monday on the option block. He says, is it still worth it to buy, quote, garbage calls in VIX and garbage puts in SPY? If so, how should I go about constructing these trades? Is there a specific percent out of the money or perhaps delta or premium range where these trades work the best? Also, how far out in time should I go? Are these one week, one month, or one year trades? Yeah, Matt, last year you and I were talking a lot about a garbage VIX calls a lot. That was all the rage. Lesser so garbage SPX puts, but there were some of those in there as well. Uh, mean Gene wants to know if you're still intrigued in all things garbage VIX calls and then garbage spy puts? And if so, how do you go about uh, constructing them? Is there a, a range you like to set them up with and also time frame, sir? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm using those uh, less and less. What I'm doing now is more of the, 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 uh, the put calendars uh, just because, you know, I, I don't expect a, a massive move to the downside. I expect more of a controlled uh, demolition of, of the market. So, uh, you know, I'm not using those as much. I do, I, I, I do, uh, you know, if, if I see the VIX, you know, like right now it's got a 16 handle, I'll start to look at some out of the money calls just to have them. Um, and, and I give myself some time too. I, I, I um, you know, th at least three months or something and just get some way out of the money stuff. And again, they don't need to, the, the VIX doesn't need to go there. It just needs to pop one of these times. And those things will triple, quadruple in value. So the, those are the things that I'm looking at, Mark. Yeah, you and I were joking recently that, you know, garbage VIX call used to be like a 115, right? Now it's a 60 or a 50. <laughs> so the range of garbage has changed quite a bit as well, which makes it interesting in and of itself. You see that one by three trade that went up in VIX a couple of weeks ago. Was like, I think it was a SEP 30, 60 or 46 selling one, buying three. Yeah, I think we've talked about it. Um, and again, you know, I, I'm a fan of that. So 
Yeah. I think we did talk about that. You're right. Yes. So intriguing stuff out there. Speaking of intriguing, your questions are always intriguing. We'll see how many more of you we could squeeze in here, listeners. Uh, then we got uh, Boot Camp with Dan on deck coming up right behind you. We like you folks so much. We're going to give you a nice free live taste of that one as well, because why not? It's fun. Well, let's keep the fun rolling. Let's go out to uh, Beeman, or is it B-Man? One or the other. They want to know, Matt has been running back tests for years. What surprises or tricks has he discovered that he thinks traders should know about? Well, Matt, when you're not talking to me, you're out there crunching back tests all day long. What surprises have you uncovered you want to share with our with our folks here? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good, uh, really good point uh, or question that, you know, the, the, the big things that I saw that were shocking to me was, uh, you know, the market doesn't get the vol high enough and the market doesn't get the vol low enough. And what that means is when we're back testing, you would think of when the IV is super high, that that'd be a great time to sell. It's not. It's often the worst time because they just don't get the IV high enough to match the historical volatility at that time. So that's one thing. You can't just sell, you know, you can't just sell blindly high implied volatility. So that's one thing. And another thing is you should try to uh, identify uh, you know, certain uh, signals for certain strategy. So we're, we're, we're getting much more into signals and much more into environments, uh, environmental testing, environmental back testing, meaning, for example, slope is really important for verticals. I mean, you think verticals, out of the money verticals, eh, you, know, you don't have that much uh, skew risk, but there is enough and and it does uh, impact the, the test. So, uh, you know, so find some uh, find some uh, signals, find some environments that you could test against. Um, and our, our back tester allows for that. And just, you know, you just crank through and you'll find, you know, that's the way to find things that other people don't find. And that's what you want to be doing, um, you know, as a trader is, is finding things that, that make sense, but a lot of people haven't found yet. So, uh, you know, that's a big thing. Obviously, you know, the, the the poor performance of the cover calls hate to, hate to turn the knife against the the cover call people um you know the fact that uh uh you know the way 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 out of the money puts actually work that the way out of money vix calls work if you have a good exit plan so you have to you have to be able to monetize and often that monetization is quicker than people think. So those are the main things uh, that I could think of that that I've learned from from all the backtesting work. Yeah, especially on the VIX side. You're right. We joked about that many times on ball views. You have not even hours, usually minutes to capitalize on those calls before <laughs> before it's gone. So that that's the challenge. People think they just buy those calls and they're good. But you got to be quick on the trigger finger to get out of those things. Since you're talking about lessons learned, let's jump to this one here from Mackenzie. Uh, she has a similar question. She wants to know, Matt has been scanning earnings for Options Insider for a few years now. Yes, he has. Uh, what are the lessons learned from crunching all that data we can apply to our earnings season trading? So Matt, you're just talking about some of the surprises you've noticed. Anything particular to earnings you've noticed as you've been crunching all this data? Sir? Well, yeah. I, I mean, the biggest thing that we've learned, Mark, is, is that there's definitely a weekly bias. Um, you know, the third and fourth weeks of of earnings are generally the most profitable weeks. Um, so if you're if you're long, you know th those are the, those are the times to be long. Um, and you know the 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 rest of things. Um, just trying to think, you know what they're. You know I like the calendars just like uh, Passarelli does. Uh, and, and during earnings, I've I've done some. You know we have we have reports that 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 churn out. Uh, you know, the best calendars to do um, those, you know, those the, those timings are a little bit, um, you know, technical, but, uh, you know, calendars work. Uh, so get used to get used to calendars and, and, and back do some back testing and ca around calendars and earnings. And then also, if you're if you're long, stick to, to week three and four. Um, and it's. Uh, again, it's often counterintuitive. If it's high ball, don't worry about it. it you know, that's often the, those are, you know, the, the times to get long ball. So th those, those are the things that I've learned, Mark. All right. We're coming up against it here. Let's see if we can squeeze in a few more listeners. Let's go out. To this, I like this one from Max. He wants to know, is auto available as a trade recommendation engine for traders? 
may be implemented into trade year. So can someone go out right now, Matt, and hire Otto for their own trade recommendation purposes? I love the question um, and love the reference to Otto. So Otto, you know, our, our uh, automation, uh, and we are going to be, you know, testing a lot more and, and publishing, uh, you know, we're running now almost billions of back tests. We've, we've come up with ways to, to speed up everything and, and, and we've bought these databases that are just incredible. So, we're, you know, we're, uh, and then we're testing those environments. So we're, we're going to have a lot more um, uh, trades that we're, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be putting out there, um, you know, and as far as where to put it, yeah, trade, I mean, Trader, that's a good idea. We're uh, obviously, we know Trader well, we're an RIA, so we could do a lot of things. So um, if that's the idea and there, there's some interest there, yeah, we're definitely interested in that, Mark. A couple more here we can bang out. Then we got to hop on into options boot camp. Keep Mr. P waiting here. Uh, let's go out to uh, Brian. He's got a twofer. He wants to know, is there a program or service for visualizing options pricing changes in real time uh, that can be used for market sentiment? That reminds me of your old uh, Acumen software, Matt. It wasn't quite that. It was more unusual activity, but it was a good visualization software. And also, can long-only leveraged ETFs fall apart the way SPXY did? So a twofer, sir. First off, if you know any good visualization software, have at it. Then he wants to know about can le- can long only levered ETFs fall apart like SVX one? Yeah, let's take the last one first. I mean, uh, I I think uh, the sponsors are a lot smarter, but uh, th- those st- still can fall apart. So you know, I'm often wary of of, of those. And, and, and again, I have some you know, very sophisticated clients over the years that would just take these apart and have such, such an advantage on me and others in the market that I, I uh, shied away from trading things like that. Um, as far as uh, visualizing option price changes, well, um, you know, of course we have a couple things we have um, when you pull up, when you pull up a, uh, a trade, for example, it could be even an iron condor or you know vertical or, or a single leg. We show what the price was yesterday and why it changed. So it's a, it's a pretty neat visualization. Was it delta? Was it gamma? Was it slope? Was it um, what was it? So that's kind of cool. And then we also have um, you know now we just released today and, and sent an email blast out. Um, you know historical. Uh, pri- minute by minute pricing. Uh, you could go back uh, any time back, you know, a couple of years. So uh, we could, you could, and then you could graph things on that. You could graph implied volatility. You could graph uh, our theoretical values. You, you could graph Greeks. So, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a, a cool visual. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have a trade builder. You know, you should check out our, our dashboard.orats.com for, for some visuals. Um, trying to think. Um, who else had some good visuals? Um, I'll have to think about that, Mark. I'll get back to you. But, you know, ORATS has, has our share. Well, Mr. Matt, we'll have to leave it there. We're out of time, sir. But I appreciate you joining us for episode 100. Did you have a good time, sir? Yeah, it was great, Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, quite an honor to be uh, the bookends at 1 and 100. Mr. 1 and uh, 100. No one can take that away from you, sir. I'll be on your awesome tombstone. questions. I mean, uh, kudos to your uh, followers, your clients, whatever you call them, your pros. Uh, great questions. And it was a lot of fun, Mark. Yes, it was indeed. You mentioned all the stuff you have cooking. If folks want to go check it out for themselves, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Yeah, you can email me, matt at orats.com. Um, like I said, we're... we're we're busy as, as, as we can be um, with uh, exit alerts, with um, history, trade histories. Uh, we're coming out with a, a very easy way just to see all the back tests that we've run, show you the back tests that we like. So that's going to be really cool. And then, then after that, we'll be working on implementing those so you could almost automate those uh, in our paper trading. And then we're, uh, connecting to brokers as well. So there's a ton going on at ORATS. So it's a lot of fun. Ton going on. Check them out. ORATS.com, O-R-A-T-S.com or option rats on Twitter, the place to go to learn more. We got to get on out of here listeners because we got the black hatted one himself waiting in the wings. And you know what? Because we like you folks, cause we're still celebrating pro Q and a 100. We're going to keep the question answering party going with a little bit of options boot camp. Live, so you guys can join that one and have your questions answered live there as well. 
And that'll be starting live in just a couple of minutes, listeners. So stay tuned for that. And then, of course, we'll see you back here on Friday for Options Oddities on the pro side. Then back again next week, another great pro Q&A session. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>